Good evening, everybody. This is Tim Herrod from British Orienteering. Um, this evening, we're going to be delivering you, with the help of Simon Errington from Happy Hearts, um, a purple pen, understanding how to use it, and hopefully moving on to some advanced techniques. During the evening, because we're lucky to have so many of you registered, we're hoping to take questions probably towards the end. So by all means, send in your questions and we'll see how we go on with the presentation but hopefully we can flow through. Um, just as a couple of points, we'll have some breaks of at least two during the way through to ask you a couple of questions about Purple Pen and how you use it or if you use it. But basically what we'll be doing now is we'll be handing over to Simon, who's gonna give you the presentation um, and uh, hope you all enjoy it. And like I say, uh, anytime put some questions in, but we probably won't interrupt it until we can see if there's any natural breaks. Okay, so we'll hand over now to Simon. So hopefully you enjoy it and uh, I'll speak again in a bit. Right, are we in business? We are. So uh, right, you. thank you, Tim. Um, good evening to all those people that I can't see. This is a very weird experience talking to lots of people that I can't see and getting no feedback at all. Um, anyway. Um, what we're about to look at is understanding Purple Pen. Um, so out of the blue, about two months ago, I got an email and Tim said, could you find anyone to do a presentation on this? And somehow it ended up as me. Um, we weren't quite sure what to do, so this is what I'm going to try and do. Uh, and hopefully it'll uh, be what you expect. Uh, I'm basically going to walk through the planning process um, and, and show you how I would use Purple Pen. Um, so the, the main stage is um, that's how to go about producing a set of draft courses initially, um, then the process of updating that following site visits, control of feedback, uh, and then the, the finalising of everything ready to go off to the printer. Um, luckily, uh, a couple of months ago, I planned one of the Happy Hearts Saturday series um, using the purple pen, so I've used that as the, the reference to show you some of the things I did then. Um, I, I, as I say, I, it's only me by accident. I'm not the resident guru on purple pen. I'm just a user who's used it for a fair time. Um, so you'll see some things I do, you know, maybe other ways of doing it, but let's see how it goes on. Uh, and, and very bravely, I'm trying to do a lot of this as a live demo. Um, we shall see what happens, but excuse any slight mistakes. Um, I've spent five minutes frantically trying to work out how to do something just before Tim arrived, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, just a little bit of background about purple pen and, and the alternatives because people have asked me that um it, it's, for those of you who haven't been orienteering the 40 years that i have uh, in the distant past my introduction to planning involved a large piece of cardboard lots of pins and colored string um, and you pinned things onto a photocopy of the map and you wound colored string around to plan the courses and after you've got all that sorted you hand drew your overprints um, that's a world that you're all well away from now <laughs> Uh, what that does leave you with is three real options, I think, uh, that people will have come across. Purple Pen, which we're going to talk about tonight. So that's maintained by Peter Gold on the West Coast of America, I think. Um, again, he's one of these names that you, you see. I've no idea who he is, wouldn't know if he was sitting next to me, but thanks very much to Peter for producing this system that we're about to talk about. Um, the other two main options that people come across is probably Condes. Um, quite a long history of Condes developed by Finn Arlson, who's a member of the IOT committee uh, based in Denmark. Uh, that's based on a club license. Um, Happy Hearts have had a license for a long time. And I've spent a lot of time planning with that in the past. Um, and the other option is OCAD. Um, it's one of the many things you can do with OCAD. Uh, there's various license options, but I think that's tending to get much more specialised. So I guess people are most likely to come across Purple Pen and Condes nowadays. Um, but for tonight, it's Purple Pen. So hopefully most people have got uh, Purple Pen installed and had a go. Um, if not, well, the website's there. There's lots of good stuff on the website. Um, the the programme itself we'll look at later has got a very good help system built in. So if you get stuck, go to the help and it'll give you at least a clue in the right direction. Um, there is a, a fairly um, active mailing list that you can subscribe to. And you can see lots of questions coming through. They tend to be things about how do I get this print to work like it should, or how do I do this, whatever. And there's some, some good feedback. A lot of the British orienteers involved in that. Um, and there's also quite a nice system where you can suggest updates that you'd like to Purple Pen and vote on them. 
Um, and indeed, some of the stuff we'll talk about later was something I suggested and that Peter's had built in. So thank you very much to him for that. OK, um, we're getting close to doing something. Before you start, a um, couple of things. You're going to need a map file. Most people will probably be using an OCAD file. Uh, the good thing about Purple Pen is it will read all the versions of, of OCAD that are floating around, um, even the, the latest OCAD 18. Um, it will also read open the interior map of files if you, you've got an app used in that. It will use um, JPEGs and PDFs and whatever, but it's less, less ideal to plan that. So if possible at all, I'd, I'd go for an OCAD file. Um, and version control we'll talk about when we've started to, uh, to have a look. So I think what we're going to do now is move to the system itself. So hopefully most people have um, at least started this. So I'm just going to talk through the start process of, of creating a, a double pen file. So this will be a purple pen uh, demo. This is the event title for now. We can change any of this later. So the next thing, we're going to pick up the map file. And for the starting point, I'm going to go back to as we had for the No Man's Land event I planned. This is a, a map from a couple of years ago. So we knew this was going to need to be updated as part of the planning process, but that was the file I had at that stage. Um, so it's there. Uh, and now the first big decision. So when it reads the map file, it can work out what the scale is in that map file. And so that's drawn up onto 10. But I know that that's quite a small area, and we tend to do most of our events on small areas like that at seven and a half hour, if only because that fits nicely onto A4. So the map scale itself is one to 10, and we're going to print it at one to seven and a half thousand, and I'll show you some ways to check that in a minute. Um, in a lot of cases, your map file, you'll be going straight from one to 10 and staying at one to 10, or you might have to a one to 15 found map where you want to produce 15 and 10. Um, it'll deal with all of those things. But just as an example, so we've got a map scale at 1 to 10, and I want to print my courses at 7 and a half. Um, and as I said, this fits nicely onto a landscape A4, so I'll we'll set that as the default again. That can be changed later. When I want to save things, well, for now, we'll put it in the same folder as the map file. Um, and then you get to choose the descriptions and the um, map standard. So at the moment, we want the 2018 descriptions. So that's just changes the symbols available. That's always hopefully going to be the case now. Um, and map standard, I'm trying to remember what difference that makes, but for now, we'll go for that. Um, and again, you can change later if needed. Um, one option you've got, it will auto number controls when you add them, um, which is quite a useful feature. You know, the way that we work within Happy Arts is that we talk to the equipment officer and they say, oh, please use these numbers. And I happen to know that we were told to start at 150. So I can say my first control will be 150 and then it will allocate them over there after that. So there we go. And I've now got everything set up. And magically, everything appears. And it looks like a pretty portrait rather than landscape, but we can change that. So let me talk you through a few things. Um, this is where it's very difficult to explain what I'm doing it, it, because I'm I'm so used to just doing things with the mouse moving around the screen, dragging and dropping. So I'll try and talk it through for people who are not, are not quite so familiar with it. Um, Purple Pen itself has got all sorts of keyboard features and menu drop downs and mouse options. And I tend to use things on the mouse. So you'll see me to, to, to drag and drop, for example, left click and drag and drop, right click and drag and drop will move the screen. Uh, you can do that in other ways with the sliders down the bottom or whatever, but I just, as a mouse person, tend to do that. Similarly, for Zoom, I could scroll down here on the Zoom bar on the bottom right, but I've got a, a mouse with a scroll wheel on it, and I would always, but if you see it zooming, it's because I'm using the scroll wheel, so you're not seeing anything happening on the screen, but that's my mouse doing that, and it just makes life easy. Um, and again, there's some options up here to Zoom and things like that, but most of what I do tonight is going to be on the mouse. Um, so let's check a few things. Let's first of all, this very, so the white area there is showing me what the print area is. Um, and annoyingly, I've set it up incorrectly. So what I can do is go to set print area on the menu here. So we'll set it for all courses. I'll change it to landscape. And for now, there we go. So that's saying print within that, that space, please. We can change that list if needed, but there we go. So that'll line it nicely. Um, a couple of other things that are useful to check. 
Um, firstly, the scale. One of the things that people have all sorts of fun with is the scale. Um, there's a very simple way to check it. So on add special item, what we're just going to do is draw an uncrossable boundary of the scale bar. And that uncrossable boundary we draw there. And in an ideal world, that line, which says 500 meters there, down here in the bottom left-hand corner, it says the length of that line is 503 meters. So the good news is that we've got the scale right and everything lines up. It's just a very useful check to make sure you don't end up printing the wrong scale, planning course is the wrong length. Um, and the other, uh, sorry, the other setup that's really important to consider is to do with um, the overprint size itself. So what I'm going to do just quickly from up on, on the bar across the top, I'm going to add a start, which is the thing roughly about there I've decided is I'm going to add a finish somewhere over here, it's because the car park's up in the top left corner, so that's where we need to start and finish. I'm going to stick a control in. Um, but let's just go on the event customize appearance box. So this, this is where you can set all sorts of parameters associated with the overprint. And the critical bit here is this scale eight item sizes. And there are three options in there. Um, and the, the help screen will talk you through all of them. But essentially, if do not scale, what that means is these numbers that you've got in these boxes up here are exactly what will appear on your printout. So that's you saying, I want it to be exactly this size. Don't do anything clever with the scale. Uh, the next option is pretty much what the ISOM standards say, which is these are the values for 15 thou, but I then scale them based on the print size. So if I print at 10 thou, then I will get everything um, bigger because you scale up from 15 thou to 10 thou. If I print at 7.5 thou, I'll get it twice as big as the 15 thou. Um, and the, the way I happen to have this one set up because it works okay for what we're doing is relative to the map scale, which involves saying, well, these are the scales, these are the sizes we're going to use, and then we'll scale it up based on the print scale. So if, if this is a 10,000 map, these are 10,000 sizes. If I print it 10,000, this is what I'll get. If I print it 7,500, they're going to be scaled up by the factor of 10 to 7,500, which is 1.33. You might need to play around with this. You might need to find what your club preferred settings are. Um, but it's worth, at some stage, doing a quick check of um, what circle size you've got so you don't end up with huge circle sizes or, or small ones that you want. Um, so for now, I'm going to leave those settings as they are. Um, and we can briefly go through how you might go about starting to plan some courses. Um, one of the things that might be quite, let's add a course to start off with. So to add a course, we go up to the course drop down at the top, add a course. Let's just say my lowest course is white. Um, so there's various options here. It's a normal course, the alternative to score. At a later stage, we can change all these things. Um, but for now, we'll just leave it as white with seven and a half thou. And then what I can do is start to add some controls to that. So to add a control, I can click on the other control button and I can put a control anywhere I want. Let's say that's the first one. And one of the first useful things is maybe to say, well, if I do a course which does roughly this, how long is it? Okay, so straight away, what that tells me is, well, that's that sort of shape is 1.7k. That's pretty okay for a white. So if we start and finish there, I'm looking at roughly a course which does that sort of loop to get me the, the white course I need. If we were to go and look at something like an orange course, let me add a, sorry, add an orange course. And later, that's going to need to be a bit longer. Let's see what it might look like vaguely. Well, I'm going to go to there first, and then it might want to come out of this corner. And I can probably cross the road with the orange a bit. So that's, is that sort of shape going to give me what I want, two and a half, three K? That's 2.3. So I could do an orange, which did something like that. And that just gives you a very quick way. Um, these controls don't mean anything at the moment. It's just a quick way of getting a feel for where the courses can go, what sort of shapes you might fit in. Um, let's be a bit more um, careful now. Let's go back to the white. So along the top here, I've now got a, a tab that shows all controls. There's everything I've put in. A tab for each of the courses I've added. So there's a white course um, and then the orange. 
let's look at this white course and start thinking about how it might look okay so white courses we know that white courses need to be on paths and follow line features um, so there's a control there probably not quite the right place let's say we've got one of this junction here so to move stuff around it's, uh, it's because that's on the orange as well it's saying to want to move on both courses that's for now yes um, and then I want to put in some more controls so to add a control one of the ways to do it is just click on the line between the two controls, click Add a Control, and I can put a new one in. So along that path, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to come probably to this part section here. And then to get to three, they're not going to be able to do that. So we probably need to put something around here. And then four looks to be about here. And then somehow we need to get around this corner. So let's say come to here. And then I might put the control. And then oh, this is a bit long to go all the way to seven, so we probably want to put one on one of these thickets, maybe. And there we go. Oh, let's say cap there, nine, and then no. So that's a mistake. I'll just press escape, it cancels anything you're doing. And then to the finish, I'm going to put a nice control on here that everyone can have so that everyone comes off the same place. And there I've got what looks like a, a, a reasonable white. We have a bit of playing with, but it, uh, very quickly I put together a, a, a rough course that I can now think about in more detail. The notice is that at this stage I'm not worried at all about things like control description or whatever, I'm just getting a feel for the shape of the course and, and where it might go. Um, so that's the first one. What you might want to do then is say, well, okay, that's the white, what can we do with the yellow? Um, one of the useful things that you can do at this point is say, well, I, I know the yellow is going to be similar to the white, so what I could do is create a white course. Um, just by copying that course I've got. So rather than that course, I can do a duplicate course. Um, so let's call this the yellow. And because up in the top, I've got the white course selected when I do this duplicate, what it's going to give me is a copy of that white course, which you'll then call yellow, and then I can play around with that yellow. So there we go. Here's yellow, it's the same as white. Along the yellow, we might try and do something slightly different. Um, and I'm desperately struggling to remember how I did things differently. I think that's. We'll, we won't do all, but let's say we don't want six, so let's take six out. I can just highlight six, and press the delete key, and it disappears. I like that one again, press the delete key. Let's say we're going to take them up across here, which is what I decided in the end. So I can now add some more controls. Uh, I want to cross the road, so there's a road crossing there. We can marshal, that's fine. And then a nice short control over here. Now I'm going to feed them up through these parts somehow. I want to get And then we'll cross the road again up here. So we've got something here. And then I'm going to feed them down through, maybe through this part somehow. So again, I'm building up a shape of a white course, but of a yellow course. It's probably too easy at the beginning, so I need to think about that. But I, as you can see, I can quite easily put stuff in, play around with it, tweak it, um, and, and get some shapes, get some ideas, uh, and then begin to go back and think in more detail. So. That, that's the process of beginning to develop some courses. What I can do now is I'll actually go to the stage I got to when I had a set of courses that I was reasonably happy with as a first pass. So I'm going to just save that for now and I'll open a file I've got here, which is version one. One of the things I mentioned briefly earlier is, is version control. To me, it's very important to keep versions of the planning process as you go along. So each key stage we save that file with a unique file name and then that's it. We then start a new version. And I always just use V1, V2, V3 as you get through. Um, for small events, you might get three or four versions. I've worked on bigger events where we've had 10, 15 and 20 versions of the courses. But you need to be able to say, this is the current version we're working on. Everyone knows that that's the system. Um, and so when you send a thing to the controller, for example, that's a version that's frozen. He then comments, you make updates in the next version. When you go to site and take sites and, and then you feedback from that, you freeze the version before you go to site and start a new version after coming back. Um, so this is the, I'm going to open V1, which is where I got to after I'd finished my, my draft courses. So this is purely from sitting at home. This is what I ended up with. Um, and you can see I've got a white course, I've got a yellow course, I've got orange, light green, and blue, and they're all roughly the right length. So, um, and I know roughly where all the controls need to be. Um, so that is the set of courses that I took out to site to check um, and sent to the controller for comments. You need to judge 
whether you want to go to the controller first before you go to site, whatever. That's that's for you to decide with them. But um, so this is basically the before we ever got near the forest. This is my, our first set of courses. So when I went out to the forest, I said the Newfoundland actually, I went out with this all controls map um, and went out and taped sites and just looked and did all the things you do on site as an all part of the planning process. Um, probably the thing I've missed is that before you get there, it's worth having a go at putting in control descriptions. Even if you don't know exactly what they're going to be, put in a suggested one and it gives you something to, to edit on or to, to check on site. So we haven't looked at control descriptions. To put in a control description, I highlight a control. So I click on 172 in that case. Um, so that highlights 172 over here. And then what I can do is just clicking in any of these bo this box allows me to put any symbol I want. So I can make this a spur or I can make this a, um, this is where I meant to know all the symbols, covered area. Um, but in this case, it's some large depression. So we'll go back to making that a large depression. Um, and I'm guessing I'm going to put it in the eastern end. Uh, the useful thing to know is if you've got something in one of these columns that, that you don't want, this box takes it away. So you can always delete anything and put it back. So the, the box, at the, the, just the open square at the bottom here, is the critical one to, to get rid of the stuff you didn't want if you made a mistake. So let's go back to there. So there we have a set of courses and uh, control sites that are at the stage where it's worth going out to check things and, and get some feedback. Um, and we've probably been through a reasonable introduction to much of what's available. Um, we'll look at Tim and say, do you want to quick break and do yeah. whatever? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Simon, for that. Basically, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to uh, ask you a question, part of the survey as we go through, so we can get a bit of understanding of what you do. So I'm going to just run uh, a poll. So it'll just be a minute. So if you can just answer this, that'd be great. And hopefully you should be receiving it now. Yeah, so if you can actually just answer it when you've got a moment, that'd be great. Thank you. Sorry for that, we seem to have a bit of a problem with the poll. Um, so what I'll do is I'll try and sort that out in the meantime, and uh, I'll hand you back over uh, once uh, Simon's well, caught his breath to, to move on to the next one. one. So uh, I'll just swap over, over, over now, and then I'll come back to the poll when we have a moment. Okay, okay, thank, you thank you very much. much. Okay, so we're back in business. Um, so we left you in that small gap um, with a first set of courses. Um, so now we're at the stage where I've come back, I've had some feedback from the controller, I've had feedback from checking sites in the forest, um, and I need to reflect any of those changes and, and then get on and finish the other print setup. Uh, so the first thing that happens quite typically after you've been out like this is that you go to the mapper, who in this case was me. So I just said to myself, can I have a new map, please? And that results in the, the need to change the map. So to do that, on the event drop down, it says map file. And what I can do is pick up a new map. So you can see that I went from the 2017 map 
which in the last one we've had is the one I've updated. Um, and that will just open and replace the one you've got. And you'll see I did some layout changes to make it a bit prettier. Um, but more relevantly, various things had happened in the forest, um, which required some feedback or some changes. So for example, you can see over here that this depression, which had been quite a long way in, actually turns out to be right on the edge. Um, so that circle, which had been on the depression, needs to be there. So you need to go through and check that any map changes uh, are correctly reflected in your position, uh, um, control positions. I think there were probably a few others. Yeah, it looks like that tree moves a little bit as well. Um, so as a result of that, what I ended up with, and, and, and also I need to go through and, and make any tweaks to the courses and, and tweaks to the control descriptions. So as a result of that, I ended up with um, a version two of my file. So what I'm going to do is close this one and open instead version two of my planning file. Oh, yeah, as it was. So hopefully version two, yeah. So this is what, I, what I'd ended up with. Um, so having come back, the first thing I went through all the control descriptions and changed them as necessary. Re, um, one of the things you'll see is, for example, that when I got to site, this nice depression here, which looks a really nice feature, turned out to be in the most horrendous vegetation and there was no way in the world anyone was gonna get in there. Um, so that, that control went and got replaced by another one. So that just means you need to go through each course and, and, and edit them as necessary. Um, so it's just a question of, of going through and making sure that any changes you've, you've got back uh, are made. And you can end up with, a, with the courses that you need. Um, so this is probably an iterative process. The map changes might be iterative depending on the extent that they are. Um, and the updates feedback from controllers. In fact, my organizer went out and walked around and assisted a few things as well. Um, so, but eventually you'll get to the stage where you say, well, I'm now reasonably happy. No, I'm now happy that I've got all the control sites I need and I've got the courses correct. Um, and I've edited the courses and I've changed it. So, I'm just trying to think here. Um, so once you get to that stage, it's really, once everyone's happy, we need to make all the final adjustments to the map before it's ready to print. So that involves adding all these extra things. So what I'm going to just do is, is talk through all the various bits you might need to add and how you might go about it. So let's start off with, um, let's start off with, I'm trying to work out what the best place to go is. Let's just, well, let, given I've got the yellow up and it happens to have text as well, one of the questions you need to decide is whether you're going to use pictorial descriptions, um, text descriptions, or in this case, both. So on a particular course, I can go to that course, I can go to properties, and I can now start to think about it. Um, and so one of the drop downs down here is how do you want the descriptions? So I could say that was just symbols. So if I close that, I just get symbols. I could say, um, course properties I could say I just want I just want text and I could say I want both as we decided in this case sorry course properties symbols and text um, so the symbols are straightforward because they're all built in you don't need to do anything the text of text descriptions should you need it is actually um, configurable so one of the things you can do if I'm in the right place is this off the event menu is customized description text. So for each thing you've got there, um, you can customize what it says. So just out of um, interest, let's put in a, um, let's change five in this not. Let's pretend that five is a black cross. If I find a black cross in this list, there we go. So now you can see control five has come up as southeast side, a special item. Well, I'd always, if possible, especially with things like the, the black circles and crosses, the special items, I'd try and write in what it was. So let's say it was a bench. So the option I've got is to go in customize description. That black cross special item, I can change that text. And it's, it's actually quite clever. It differentiates between one or many. So if it's bench, I want bench. And if it's benches, I want benches. Um, and now you will see hopefully that 
the description over here has changed the bench. So it's always worth, if you're going to use text descriptions for, for some of the junior courses, um, making sure that you've got certainly the, the special symbols described as they are, and, and maybe even some of the others are a bit wordy and you, and you can do something about it. Um, so that's setting up the descriptions. We've not actually explained how to, to put these descriptions on. So um, let's delete that one out of interest and start again. So to put these control descriptions in, here's a, a, a add descriptions here, or in fact, you can do it up to here as well. But let's just click on there and then you drag and drop um, and then resize as necessary. So this is where you try and get the layout. Um, so you can play around with that. The other critical thing to understand about purple pen is um, how you decide which, which maps get which items. So that is off of the, this is where he has to look at the item. Right, so on item, so the, these things you put on, special things like um, descriptions and whatever are items, you can, if I highlight that item, you can then say which courses you want it on. So I've just put that expression on the yellow, um, but you can tick the courses you want. So it turns up on whichever course you need. Um, so I could say it's on the orange as well, or I could just step on the yellow. But um, pretty much any of the special stuff you put on, you'll get the option to say which courses you want to put it on. And it's done through this box like this. Um, so for example, the other thing, one of the other things I've added in here is text to say what the course is, just a big label so it's clear when you get the map up. So that's, um, you'd add in as, um, I knew this was going to go wrong when I started to do the demos because this is not doing the bit I want on text. So we're going to add some text. Um, one option is just to say text and it will put whatever you want. So I could add that. Uh, and so there, it's, it's just typed in words that I happen to have typed in. Um, delete that and start again. The other option, um, as we're using this sorry, um, yellow course up here, is some of the text is if you can put in special. So you've got a whole set of things that you can add to your map um, wherever you want. So course name, parts, variations, all sorts of things. So for example, um, I keep telling you about version control. So one of the options I've got is to add the file name somewhere on the, on the um, overprint, so I could check it if I wanted to. So if I did that, I could just down here put there, and then people could check that that's the right one. Um, you might say that's a bit dominant and no one's interested. So one of the options there is that I could um, change that text and I could just make it very small. So it's still there if people want to look at it. But no one sees it. So there's all sorts of clever things you can do, and I'm sure people have found all sorts of things that I haven't even talked about where they can do things like this. But, the, but let's go through the, the things you, you probably do want to think about in terms of um, finalizing the overprints. So course name are always useful so that when you pick the map up, you've got an idea what you've got the right course quickly. Um, any out of bounds and crossable boundaries. Um, the way we plan these courses, we weren't worried about this. It's a fairly minor road, and we're already forcing the, the shorter courses across. But I could, for example, put in um, some uh, road out of bounds markers like this. It must be worth the half there. There it is. Yeah. So you can put in things like that. Um, so out of bounds, you can think about. Um, what else is on my list for across when talked about bounds? Um, other texts. So, for example, what if I got down here? This we want this um, course's close information. So, rather than put that in the descriptions themselves, what I've done is I've just added a, a, a rectangular outline like that. And then within that rectangular outline, I put in, as I said, Courses in spell. Courses. So you put any text you want in there. So you can build up your own little block of information as necessary. So that's how I've done this. And then 
all of these items will be going to look at whether used are set up to display on all the courses. So what that means is that I put that in once and then all the courses can use that same piece of information. Um, let's think about some of the other things that you need to worry about in terms of, of overprint. And, then, and particularly, let's look at the control circles and the, the course um, legs. So let's start with control circles. Um, one of the things you might want to do is break, break the control circles. So here you can see that I've broken the control circle to show that thicket and the, and the path through. So that's very straightforward. I click the circle itself, and then up in the top right here, I click add a gap, and then I can just drag a gap somewhere I want to take out, and there it goes. Um, so it's what I tend to do is go back to the all controls map as a starting point, and then just go through one control at a time and say, that there's that, do I want to break that? Or yes, I probably want to break it for this stuff here. But it turns out, in this case, that um, the courses that use this control are never interested in those features. So I never didn't bother to break that one. Let's look at some others, 152. As I said, yeah, we've broken those two there. So this is just a question of working through methodically and looking at all the breaks and saying, do I need a break? And, and putting it in as necessary. Um, whilst you're doing that, as a final check, it's always worth checking the control description actually matches what you've got. So that we can see thick it. Um, what we said more to your side, yeah, that's fine. What's this one? This has come down to be thick it southwest corner on the side, yeah, that's okay. So just in, for, 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 in terms of controls, it's methodically working through. Check the circles over the right feature. Um, check the description's correct. Uh, and cut any circles you might need. Um, one of the things that you can do, uh, there's a whole series of reports which are quite useful. And, and let's look at the event audit report in particular. So that will just generate a list of all controls. Um, uh, and one of the things it will tell you is the distance between controls. So if you're worried about controls being too close together, this will give you um, the distances between them, and then you can go away and check in particular. So 160, 182, am I worried about that? Let's find 160. Uh, so 160 is there, 182 is there. 182 is down the bottom of the signal entry. 160 is the yellow course control on the path going through there. So I'm quite happy that they're distinct controls, and there's not going to be a confusion there. Um, but, but that event audit report is a very useful um, thing to check to make sure. Um, any problems. It'll also highlight uh, legs running both directions. Some people see this as a big problem and it's worth avoiding if possible, but it'll just highlight things like that. Um, so that's sorting out um, circle overprint. For the courses themselves, there's a whole set of other things which is worth looking at. So if I go to a course, so I want to make sure I've got a nice um, course name somewhere or number. So in this case, yep, fine, they're all looking okay. We'll come on to that part in a minute. Um, number positioning. So the next thing to worry about is the number positioning. Um, so in general, Purple Pen will put number in a reasonable place uh, and it does adjust them to try and avoid conflicts, but it's always worth going through each one and saying, am I happy with that? So to move a number, you just click on the control itself and then I can drag the number wherever I want to get where I'm happy. To, to put it. So if I want that third level, it's a bit too far here. Move over there. And then you can just again work methodically around the course. Happy with that control, yeah. Um, they all look okay. So check all the number positioning. Line breaks. So there are various things we need to think about with line breaks. Um, the first straightforward easy one is um, that where courses cross, Purple pen by default would automatically put a break in the line between the higher numbered controls. Um, I must admit that I spent 20 years planning courses and never having really thought that through about you always break the, the line from 10 to 11 rather than the line from 3 to 4. So someone, some experienced controller explained it to me. But anyway, that's what Purple Pen does. It will automatically put a line break in for you here just to avoid crossing lines. You don't have to have that. It's one of the options, I think, in. One of these options up here. Um, 
back out, but I've forgotten exactly where it is, but it's one of the things you, you can say is I don't want my line break. Uh, but by default, I'd leave it on. It's, it's a standard thing that makes life easier. So line, line breaks from courses, from where the um, course crosses over is done automatically. The other thing that you might need to worry about are line breaks where there's features hidden. So for example, if I was worried about this track junction here, what I can do is highlight that line and then it, again I can add a gap in that line so I can just take that part of the line out to say no I need to be able to see under that so you may need to cut certain like certainly here for example if, if I was worried about people using these, these depressions as navigation features click the line uh, click the add gap and uh, people can see what they're doing um, the other thing you might need to do with lines, of course, is to move them to avoid overlying features, especially on courses like the white and yellow. Um, I don't think I had such an issue here. But let's let's tweak this a little bit. So, for example, if this control had been a little bit further south and this control had been a little bit further north, we'd end up with this scenario where the, the line between them goes right over this path so that the people can't see that that's the way to get there. Um, so what we need to do in that point is to move the line, bend the line. So one way to do it is just to add a bend into it. So I click a bend in and then I can drag that bend wherever I need to. And you can see now that that line is now nicely away from the, um, from the path. And you can see the path underneath, and you can still see the, the line join. Um, if I needed to, I could put another bend in here just to be clever. Um, and so this is also how you do if you've got, say, take root. You put in features like this just to move the lines around. But you can see it's very straightforward. And then just that allows people that keep people on this course to see the feature underneath, uh, but still have the line going from the right way. Um, so that's line breaks. Well, uh, if I go on to the yellow course, um, road crossings. Let's have a, a quick think about road crossings. It turned out here that we didn't decide to use, we, we, we could put in a mandatory crossing symbol. So one of the things I can add is a mandatory crossing point. Um, I could add it here. That's pretty nice. So I'm going to do that and do this properly. So say in 11 to 12, I wanted to put a, a road crossing in here. Let's put add um, mandatory crossing point here. And then I decide I'd like to rotate that. So that item, I can rotate, I can drag it around, so that's about what I'd like. And then from 11 to 12, I want to say use that mandatory crossing point. Um, so it, it's, it's all automatically put that in. Um, what we did instead of using, in this case, instead of that, because it's made every group very complicated, um, instead of that, what I've done is put in some text in the control descriptions. Uh, essentially, this is a very lightly used road, and the controls right next to it, so you can see what's going on. And we had people manning the, the controls any of the road crossing anyway. But what I put is some text. So to put text in after a control, um, let's say we'll put some text in after control one, as an example. What I can do is just add a text line. So I can put in something like that, and that's going to come after control one, five, three. And you've got the option of saying that's on all courses or just on this course. Because uh, in some cases, if you're going different ways and there's a tape route in one way and not the other, you don't want it, for example. So you've got that control there. Um, I think after that, I cancel the button. Let's just add it to prove it works. Uh, so there we go. So there's that new line I've just put in, appearing in the descriptions. Um, that's road crossings. So I think we've now probably been through most of the, the, the features that you're going to need as a, to finalise your courses and, and get everything ready. Um, what I've got left to talk about is some extras and, and printing and whatever. So Tim, if you want yeah. to...
Thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, Simon's just going to have a minute break. Uh, hopefully this time we're going to run a poll and it will work. Um, so I'm going to launch it now. What I'll also do is I'll give Simon a chance. To, I know five of you have asked some questions. Um, hopefully he can answer them before we move on to anything else because he's got the map and everything ready. So we're going to launch the poll now. Probably do that. Right, okay. So I, 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 I can't hear anything. Yeah, you, you should have got everything. Yeah, sure. Right, I'm just going to open a final version of the, the, the map courses so we've got something there to look at. So I'm going to read down these, um, these questions and <laughs> do my best to answer. So the first question I've got is Could you please show again how you dragged and dropped the descriptions onto the map? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new call. Just going to do on here. So let me delete that old one. So add, to add descriptions, you click on the add descriptions button, and then that allows you to just drag and drop any space. And there they come. And then you can resize that um, as you need to. Um, what it does, it, it, it's a bit hit and miss at times because it automatically decides when to um, break into multiple columns and things. Uh, depending on where you're trying to fit stuff. But essentially, it's a drag and drop thing. If you make it too narrow, it will decide to drag, drag it taller. There we go. Um, and then it always goes like that. I, I think one of the things that's been discussed in the past is that as a change is to be able to fix the actual size of these, these boxes. I, I can't remember where that's got to. But the, if, if you read the, um, the iOS specification, there's a thing about how big these boxes should be. Um, so it, it, I, it, I can't remember whether this, the, it's been done or not, but you might be able to just actually set the size to say, I want these to be six, six centimeters, six centimeters boxes. But anyway, that, that's it. You, so descriptions, just add descriptions, and then you drag and drop, and then the item that you put on, you can resize as necessary. Okay. So can you choose text or pictorial? Can you choose, yeah, so to choose text or pictorial, as we said, if you go to the course, course properties, these are where things change like that. Um, so, of course, so the description appearance is this button here. So symbols, text, or symbols and text. So I could change back to symbols in this case. There you go. So that's done on a per course basis. For each course, you can decide what you want. Um, I think the default is probably symbols, and then but you see you can set text if you want. But that's how it's done. There's there's lots of things. It, it, just look through this properties box. I mean, there's probably some other stuff in here we've not talked about. In particular, um, one of the things when you're finalising the course is you can type in the the client. So when you measure the client, you can put that in there as part of the finalizing the course. Um, you also have the option of putting in some secondary text or some class lists. Um, if you're, for example, um, doing a bigger event where you want to map age group courses onto uh, age group classes onto courses, you can put the, the list of classes in here. Um, and in fact, if you do it with comma separated, it actually works it out. When we talk about XML exports in a minute for results, it'll automatically generate all the, the class combinations correctly. So, but you can put any extra text in here. I can put in extra text, and then that will appear here. So that might be, I don't know, more but some event name or something. Um, okay. Font size on the control number. Font size on the control number, yeah. So 
Right? Control of the overprint is all done by customized appearance. So on the event, customized appearance. So here, you've, as we briefly talked through the various options here, but essentially these are the, the sizes of everything. Um, and you can either go with the standard sizes based on the IO specifications, or you can turn that off. And at that point, you can do anything you want. So to be used sparingly, but you do have that option to, um, to change things. You know, the thing you're interested going to tell me is that that doesn't have the control number height in it. Control circle diameter, line width, dot height, number height, that's the one. Okay, so it's, we've currently got four mil because that's the definition in the standard. Let me take that up. So, you know, in fact, let's take that up to so eight mil. Okay, so there we go. We can change the font like that. But in general, I, I wouldn't move away from the, the iOS standards unless there's a very good reason to. But that's how you would do it, should you need to. Let's go back to the standards. Just out of interest, the reason this looks really weird, where it says control circle 5.35, um, purple pen defines it from the outer side of, of the circle to, to from the outside of, it, of the line. The RF defines it from the middle of the line. Um, so this is actually the, the diameter of the circle you might expect, 5 mil plus the line width. 0.35, but that's just a technicality. This just looks a bit odd sometimes to see 5.35. Um, so anyway, so well, custom overprint um, appearance is, is here. One thing that I do like and use quite regularly is um, the white outline. So if you put a white outline around numbers, it can be a lot easier to see that number, especially in urban events where you've got controls on roads and um, control numbers on roads and, and, and out of bounds areas. So you can just put in a white outline with this um, bit here. Something like 0.1 of the mole is adequate, and it gets you a very nice, just means you get a little bit, and it's much more easy to see it. Um, but again, yeah, that's up to you whether you want to use that or not. How do you split the control descriptions to fit the space? Uh, right, how do I split them? So, again, this is basically it's drag and drop in that if I drag this to be wider, eventually it'll, it automatically does it for me. So, when it uh, as I say, it's a bit hit and miss, and I, I wouldn't know exactly what the algorithm was, but that's how you do it. You just play around with the size by dragging and dropping, and it, it sorts it out for you. And then you can move it around as necessary. Okay. Uh, why don't we use purple paint rather than compass? <laughs> um, as I say, I've spent a long time on both systems. Purple pen is, is, is the relative newcomer. Um, it's changing reasonably rapidly. There's a lot of new features come in. Peter's done a great job of adding stuff, feedback from users. To me, it's much more intuitive to use and easier to explain. Um, Comdes, there's some, some corners you have to remember how to do things. Um, the other, like one of the other issues is, is clearly cost in that there is a, a license fee for Condes, whereas Purple Pen, whilst there's a donation system in place, Purple Pen is available to anyone for free. Uh, for example, if you want to send stuff to your controller, you can just pick up Purple Pen and, and go. Otherwise, you possibly need to provide a, the club license to the controller so he can um, use Condes. But functionally, they're doing pretty much the same thing. Um, as I say, Purple Pen has recently added, had a lot of new features coming in. The big one for me at the moment is, and certainly I'm not sure whether Condes is quite caught up, but Purple Pen reads the latest OCAD file, and the Condes didn't for a long while. I'm not sure that it does yet, um, which means that if I'm using Condes, I'm having to save my map file as a special format, which is just a little bit of an awkward step, and you're always worried about the, any loss of integrity there. OK. Um, I'm getting a small bit of hurry up, so <laughs> let, let me just do a couple of quick things. Um, the, the one thing I've completely overlooked is the, the speciality on this blue course, I just need to point out, is that I've split this blue course into two parts. Um, and it's split out. So up, up on here you can now see blues in two parts. Part one comes up to control 11, and then part two goes from 11 onwards. How do you do that? Well, let's start off by undoing it, and then well, what I'm going to do uh, is put, if we do up here, add map exchange, and you've got an option of whether it's at the control or, or not. And then we can add a control where the, that map exchange is going to happen. And there you go. So I've now, that, that's how you add the, the map exchange. Um, 
And from that point on, when you look at this course, you've got a drop down to allow you to see the various parts. Um, just very quickly, a couple of things it's worth saying um, that we've not covered. There's a lot of reports up here which are worth looking at. We looked at the vent audit, but some of the others are useful as well um, and, and help you avoid some mistakes. Um, what happens what, once we got to this stage where we're pretty much finished, so we've now got it off and, and print stuff. Um, if you're dealing with an orienteering printer, a BML or a Hassan Liking, they're quite happy to take purple paint directly so you can send them the file on your map file and they'll be, we'll print from that. If not, you've got some options up here to export um, to OCAD if you want to do any further uh, changes, uh, that's less of an issue nowadays. Um, you can create your own PDFs and even print those if you need to. But I tend to, nowadays, I, I, I would tend to send the purple paint file itself and don't really use BML or, or like Nick Liking. Um, to print stuff and they're very good at producing stuff from Purple Pen directly. Um, and just finally, the other thing you're going to need to know when you're uh, planning is you're going to need to create um, the necessary files for your results system. So they come out of this create data interface interchange files, IFXML allows you to save the file. So that creates an XML file which defines the courses and that will normally go into your results system support, I don't know whatever it might be. Um, it's worth checking with your IT person. Um, they're probably accept, able to accept version two or version three, they, they don't make much difference, but just make sure that they can read that file and everything's okay before the event. You don't want to be panicking on the day about that. Um, and my own self-interest is one of the things you can do from Purple Pen is create root gadget files. Um, you don't, Root Gadget is quite happy to work with the XML file and then the, the maps out of OCAD. But one of the changes that Peter made as a result of some suggestions I, I put to him was to allow the creation of Root Gadget files, um, which include georeference maps. So you can now from here, it will create the necessary map files as well. So a, a GIF with a, with a, and it will produce world files. So if, you can now create everything you need from Root Gadget out of purple paper as well, which is very nice. Um, right, sorry about the rushing towards the end there, but I think I've probably gone through pretty much everything I had on my list of stuff to talk about. Um, if you do a search on purple pen orienteering or course planning on the, on the internet, you'll dig up a load of useful stuff. In particular, there's a document by Neil Crickmore you'll come across um, about using purple pen. Uh, which I've sort of used as a starting point for what I've done tonight. But Neil takes you through in, in quite a nice level of how to do things. But equally, several clubs have got some things available. Um, so if you get stuck, help is definitely a place to go, or an internet search tool, um, drag up a lot of other things, or the Verbal web website and mailing list itself if you get really stuck. I think, unless any other questions, for me, I'm back to Peter, no. I'm sorry, to, to Tim. Yeah, I, I want to change my camera and I'll just talk uh, through Simon's camera. Just like to thank Simon for all his hard effort over the last hour, which has been most informative to me, definitely, but hopefully to you as well. Um, obviously, this will be available online as well, so you can people can actually see and go through some of the things. So if we haven't been able to manage to answer your questions, um, have a look at that, and it should be available in the next few days. But thank you very much for your attendance and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, again, thanks to Simon for doing such an excellent job. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> this is where they see us talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, how many did you get to? 30 something? Yeah, 35. Okay. And still. I'm going to